Hey heroes, this is your resident string player, Darian. And this is Angela, your certified brass player. And you're listening to Hero Talk, the show that is here to talk about real life and real women in music. Okay, let's get started. Concert weekend with family weekend. We are. Oh, was it really? It was family weekend. We had a John Williams concert with the Wind Orchestra, and then we had a Cliff Madsen concert. Um, so I feel like ever since I became a graduate student, I never know when Parents Weekend. I only know because is. I played. Yeah, and we are undefeated. Go Knowles. <laughs> so uh, that was. Are we, we really? Did we? Did we win that game? Yes, against Boston College, we did. We uh, are we four zero? Or oh yeah, we're oh. the best college football team in Florida. Thank you. Right now. Yes. Does it deserve a button? Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> Where is it? Uh, we, need to, <laughs> we need to put the war chant on that. Um, go Noles. It's so sad. I don't even know it because I've never been to a football game. It's like, you know this, right? The the arm movement. Oh, the choppy thing? Yeah. I know there's like a horse, right? Yeah. That runs yeah. at the games. Yeah. I think I saw a video of it. Some probably online somewhere. i've actually never been to a, a football game here i need to go but anyways <laughs> yes busy busy weekend for us all yeah i've been pretty busy when are we not busy though <laughs> it's grad school life it's life maybe in summer <laughs> yeah there's some days where i'm i haven't found myself bored a lot mm. ever since like i don't know maybe my under my halfway through my undergrad i'm like when's the last time i was actually like bored for more than like a few minutes other than like maybe a really boring lecture i don't think i'm ever bored i'm usually looking for times to relax that's fair yes yeah. I, I i think bored is something that happens when you're a kid maybe yeah. <laughs> at least for me anyway yeah. my mom always always like if you're bored then you i think what did you, what was the saying go smart people don't get bored or something yeah because like usually like when you get bored you want to use your imagination and mm -hmm. you know think about things that's what i yeah. hated when she said that though just go <laughs> think about things I, th I was always looking for her to like take me somewhere or Aww, do something yeah. with me or get I my mean, sister that's really why we say it <laughs> be like my sister I'd be like i'm bored what do you want to do yes, yeah <laughs> but yeah as you get older i don't think you really get bored as much are you searching to be bored? No. You feel like, man, I just want to be bored right now. No, I'm more like <laughs> I'm searching to sleep. <laughs> <That's fair enough. laughs> Which I think t ties us into our conversation that yes. we have before we talk to Evie, who we're interviewing. Yes. But before we get to our interview, what we wanted to talk about was mental health for musicians. Yes. And how we, you know, have self-care. Yeah. Take care of our, our <laughs> inner child. Inner <laughs> yeah, so the question that we asked on our small talk on our Instagram, how do you take care of your mental health as a musician? Mm, that, I think it's so important, though. Oh, yeah, in any field, any career, especially, though, oh, yeah. as a musician. Because we are nonstop working, as we said in our last mm -hmm. podcast. And I don't think a lot of people know how physical playing an instrument can oh. be. Oh, yeah. Like, our bodies get tired. My choppies. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's like my fingers and my yeah, shoulders. That's like, fair. I've been to chiropractors who are like, why do you seem off like, like, cause our muscles are kind of like off balance, how oh, they put yeah. it because we're always like violin or viola. that we're always putting it on the same shoulder. We're like mm -hmm. tilting neck the same way for hours every day. Yeah, does your neck hurt? Oh yeah. I've gotten neck pain. Oh, dang. Our music director is like, like actually have like had a neck injury because of playing and really? stuff. Yeah. Oh my gosh. She gosh. can tell you more about that. Yeah. <laughs> but, I'll have to ask her. Um, it, it happens or I've like pulled a tendon in my finger before. Oh my god! Yeah, I was <laughs> being a stupid kid and not taking care of myself and practicing tense for too long. Ugh, and yeah. I had an orchestra rehearsal after that practice se session, and I was in orchestra, and I was like, "Can't play with my fourth finger, or it hurts really bad." Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, I guess the worst thing I have with me is my lip was bleeding one point. Mm. But yeah, I have a, also a wrist injury mm. where it's not really an injury. I have a bone abnormality in my right wrist mm. where one of my bones is longer than the other. Oh, interesting. Like, I have to sleep with a wrist brace on because since I have less tissue, like, where my wrist meets my hand, mm -hmm. because that bone is longer, mm -hmm. that I, I, I experience, like, wrist pain if when I play a long time. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, the wrist brace 
allows me to go like play longer before I start experiencing pain. So, cause, cause I'm not bending my wrist at night. So it takes longer for it to become irritated. Wow. You could really do like a mass class or a presentation on in, in injury prevention in yeah. violinist. Well, I think that'd be cool. Yeah. Oh, well, I have to sleep in a wrist brace according to my yeah. <laughs> orthopedist. Yeah. Cause the scary thing is, is I ever get tissue damage there. Cause I have about like annual MRIs on it to make sure mm. I don't get tissue damage. Yeah. Um, because they'd have to go in surgically and shorten the bone so that Gosh. tissue doesn't get damaged oh. because it's like compacted more. <laughs> But apparently it's this abnormality is, despite being considered an abnormality because of the name, mm-hmm. it's relatively common because like 20% of the oh, population really? has it. But you would only, according to my doctor, the only people who know they have it is people who use their wrists a lot. Yeah. Hence musicians yeah, and string wow. players. Um, but that yeah. comes like to the whole question of like self-care. Mm-hmm. Like what does your body need and what does your brain need hence yeah. mental care but I, I, it's all interconnected like if you're oh, not yeah. taking care of your body your your mind isn't going to be happy absolutely yes um which means like sleep and mm-hmm. feeding yourself and having a hobby outside of yeah playing i work whatever. on having <laughs> yeah maybe my hobby is walking my dog that's a, walking is a good hobby <laughs> and if it's with your dog that's even better i have to exercise him somehow or yeah. he goes crazy that's fair i went um when i'm doing like a practice session and i'm like you know, I take a break to go outside, just get the breath, fresh air. It does help. And go on a little walk around campus. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of the term grounding? Grounding. I don't like no. Like going outside barefoot and standing in the, the oh, grass. Yes. It's supposed to have like awesome health benefits. Yeah. Sometimes just it's a little the out sun. there, but. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. it I, you almost can feel a difference. Like, because if you think about it, we're all like insulated from like. It has to do with like the electromagnetic field yeah. or something of the earth. And we're like always cut off from it because everything is an insulator, like the rubber on the bottom of mm-hmm. our shoes, yeah. you know, like we're never connected to it. So if you ground yourself, it's supposed to like have some healing yeah. properties That's, and yeah. health, like mental health benefits or something. That's also like a music performance anxiety kind mm-hmm. of thing, like feeling your feet on the ground or, you know, yeah. your shoes on the ground and finding, you know, mm-hmm. ground. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of an out there idea but it almost makes sense when you break it down like that yeah but going outside i find as long as it's not allergy season there <laughs> can yeah. be quite helpful yeah but that's the things that you have to think about mm-hmm. and i know miranda our music director was recently talking about how she has to remind herself to eat Aww. and i was telling her i like it happens to me too yeah like you'll be in the middle of practicing and doing all these things and you're like wait it's four o'clock. I haven't had lunch yet. Or yeah, that, or it's like, oh, I need to practice before I go eat, even though you're like starving. You uh, know? I've definitely done that. I did that in my undergrad. I was not healthy Mm-mm. in my undergrad. Yeah. I, I think I, th- I would say that my sophomore year, I pretty much practiced myself sick because I was, I was in an unhealthy yeah. mental space and I had I ended up with mono at the end of my fall semester oh my and I like couldn't do it anything mm, i think i shot my immune system yeah i was staying up i was like the last person in the practice rooms and the first person up and i like wasn't really sleeping i wasn't really taking care of myself because i was more concerned with like being perfect yeah that's and true. that goes into like taking care of your mental health mm-hmm. yeah have you ever done anything like that to yourself oh uh, yes <laughs> all-nighters yes. oh i hate all-nighters because then you're like dead the next day yes. Yes. don't do it anyone listening who's new to college don't do it don't do it just be just Try to do it beforehand, which is so hard to say. Don't procrastinate. When you're tired, your brain doesn't function yeah, right. No. I was talking earlier with you. I'm like, I haven't budgeted my time well to eat today. Oh, yeah, <laughs> like, that's fair. I've I've like kind of had like little fruit like mm-hmm. uh, here and there, but I was like, oh, I need to stop and make sure I have like a full on meal. Full meal, yeah. Have that energy. Oh, I know. Take care of yourself. Absolutely. Which I thought some of people's responses about what they do for self care and taking care of their mental health as someone said rock climbing yeah i'm glad for the people who have the energy to do that i really want to try <laughs> that i like that that's fun i know i i know our um artistic director bella she works at the oh. rock wall at fsu really yeah it's like one of her little oh. side jobs i love that because she loves rock climbing really she's always trying to get me to go <laughs> i'll have to tell her to teach me how to rock climb oh i'm bad at it the last time i did it was like my undergrad and i didn't do it after all because you use like those tiny fingers, like mm-hmm. muscles in your fingers, I mean. Mm-hmm. And I was like, my fingers are sore. <laughs> Not my violin playing <laughs> fingers. This probably means that uh, there's some muscle to be gained there. All right, what was our next answer? Another one was surround myself with a good support system. Mental health is, I think, really dependent upon who we surround ourselves with. Yes, absolutely. It was kind of... Get rid of the toxic people. Oh, 
gosh. <laughs> yes. Get a little, you got to have like a friend group when you're in anything, but in college especially. Like for me, I would say some of my family I would consider like my support system because, you know, it's always helpful to know that there's some people that got your back. Yes, you know, absolutely. or the people to attend your concerts yeah, or that's true. to remind you to take care of yourself. Yeah. And it's also nice to have maybe non music friends. Oh yeah. You know? To remind me that there are other things to talk about. Yes. Fair <laughs> enough. Oh. Another answer was I give myself time for self care every week. That's, that's, that's amazing. And that's very smart. <laughs> and sometimes I wish I would. Do that. <laughs> I, I think I would say I, I do that. Yeah. Like if I've had a long day, I'll be like, okay, I'm not going to do something, anything related to what I'm stressed out about for half an hour. Yeah, that's fair. Or like I'm going to watch a show or I'm going to take Roscoe for a walk, you know, mm-hmm. something to get my mind off something. Or some people I know practice, um, not practicing once a week. Oh yeah. They took a day off. Mm-hmm. I find that For myself, at least, very hard to do. Uh, Yeah, I don't say I do it every week, but I have done it. Yeah. Especially, like, have you ever gotten to the point where you feel like the music needs to breathe? Yeah, but then I just go back to something else. (laughs) Well, sometimes I felt like I'm so into what I'm practicing that Mm -hmm. I just need need to come at it from a fresh perspective. So I'll take, like, a day off and then come back to it, and it's amazing what fixes itself. Oh, yeah. I get that. Or, I mean, I've been in therapy before Mm -hmm. because I have, you know, anxiety, and... I remember my therapist was like, do something that helps you get into a positive mind space where you can take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And she was like, what is something or a place that you can think of that makes you feel calm? That makes you feel like you can step back and think about what's stressing you out from a more objective point of view. Mm -hmm. And like, I've found that if I do yoga or even take a bubble bath, that I can feel like I can... (laughs) like relax for a hot second Mm -hmm. to where if I can think about all the things that make me anxious or stressful and be a little more objective about it and not so emotionally charged yeah um I love a good bubble bath Mm -hmm. dang a bubble bath girl oh uh, totally it's I need the aroma therapy from it that happens with like the smells yeah like like, all the oils and know what to get for your next birthday (laughs) or uh, a glass of wine is a nice addition Yoga is also, I'm a, I'm, I love yoga. You a yogi? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I I can't say I'm the best yogi during the school year, yeah, that's but during the summer, I'm always on top of it. Wow. I find it so, so meditative yeah. in a way, because, and I think it connects to music a lot too. I know Dr. Thomas at FSU, like sometimes does yoga in her studio classes. I love that. Yeah. Because every movement in yoga is supposed to be like supported by a move, like every movement is supported by the, a breath. Yeah. Like you don't count when you hold a pose. It's the count is how many breaths per pose. Yeah. That's kind of like body mapping. Have you heard that? Yes, I have actually. Mm -hmm. Which in music and even like when I'm teaching, I'm talking about how often the body is, has to be relaxed and has Mm -hmm. to be supported with the breath. And Mm -hmm. I'm sure in winds and brass. Oh yeah. Because you you can't play without breath. (laughs) Oh yes. There's a lot of crossover, I think. (laughs) Yes. Another one was, and I feel like this is you, but I could be wrong. This was like your response. I hike with my dog and practice positive self-talk. That wasn't mine, that wasn't but yours. I relate to that yeah. 100%. I wish I could relate. I want a dog. Another response was keep a practice journal and schedule for a reflection. Make sure I make time for myself. That's just someone who's a really good practicer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I need to be better about keeping a practice journal. Oh, yes. Do you keep one? Oh, yeah. I love my practice journal. Um, and sometimes it's very simple as in like, I'm doing this like routine and I'm like, oh, this is going to be day 25 of the routine of a 31 day long routine. Um, and that's all I put in there. And then I put like the solos I do it and like what I worked on or what I think could do better on. So sometimes it's not as detailed as it could be, but I mean, for me, it just, it works. Does like writing in my music once a week count as a practice journal? I mean, hey, it's there. I keep, so you I remember. Keep, I keep trap, trap, keep <laughs> track of things based on. I write like what I do every every practice section, like what tempo I did something at, or notes like on the music, Mm -hmm. not separate. Yeah. So I kind of feel like I do the same thing. I just don't have like a separate piece of paper. That's fair. A lot of like my practice journal is to keep of like, okay, I practiced this yesterday. I haven't practiced oh this one in like uh, three days. That's smart. You know. I feel like I do it in my head. I don't write it out. That's good. <laughs> I need I need it like out on a piece of paper or something. I do make a lot of lists though. Okay, see, there's um, that. But yeah. not for practicing necessarily. Sometimes, but 
when I have, like, especially with hero stuff, mm. to keep my brain sane, yes. I write out all the things that I possibly have to do when I feel really overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And then I, it, when it's out in front of you and not in your head, it feels less daunting, oh. especially if you can cross it out. Oh my gosh. I, oh. Sometimes I'll make a list and I've already done this thing and I'll cross it out just to have that feeling. of like, Oh, it's oh, yes. so satisfying. And then it seems like you're actually accomplishing <laughs> But you what are. You, yeah. Well, because if you have this huge list, let's say of like 20 things. Yeah. Because I've definitely had a list that long oh, of things yes. I have to do. Yes. I'd be like, okay, today I'm just going to take care of three of them. Yeah. And then it just seems less overwhelming. Yeah. And lists are amazing for your mental health. They, they literally are the best. <laughs> yes. I still have like a calendar slash agenda kind of thing. Because mm -hmm. I like to handwrite all the things I have to do. Yes. Yeah. Because I realize if it's existing and floating around in my head it seems less oh, I'll tangible forget. Yeah, i'll forget in a heartbeat <laughs> i have to write everything down in my calendar or i'll be like yeah i'm free and i'm literally not free at all and i don't do well with like a google calendar oh really i have to write it down I have to write it down mine's all in the google oh i i for some reason don't remember it as well oh that's fair or i don't refer to it as consistently mm -hmm. like i carry around it's sitting next to me right now Look at that. my little wow. calendar <laughs> I think that's all we have for everyone because a lot of these are kind of the same, you know, have a hobby, mm -hmm. take care of your body, listen to your body. And I know when you're young musicians, it's hard to feel like there are things more important than practicing to make something perfect. Yeah. But I promise you, your bodies function better when you take care yeah. of them and your brain does too. One thing that I um, learned from a professor one time was <laughs> when you're like in a practice session and you can't get these things that you have to do out of your mind like mm -hmm. oh i have to go pick up this thing i have to go take my dog out or you know mm -hmm. whatever it is in your practice session it comes to your mind you can't stop thinking about it write it down on whatever on the stand and then like it's out of your mind it's go it goes back to the list that we were talking about oh i never but thought I, about that i like it in a practice setting because i find myself thinking about so many things during a practice session all right well i think that's all we have for y'all but we're gonna talk to evie now but in, before um, we move on to that, I just wanted to say if you ever want to share your stories or experiences with us or participate in small talk, <laughs> please visit our social media. We have links to all our social media and our website on our Instagram, which is at hero.musicians. Please follow us. And you can also see our website, which can also take you to all these places as well, which is www.hero-omusic.com. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us, join the conversation, join our safe circle that we're trying to create for all of you guys. And now let's welcome Evie. Woo. Hi, heroes. We are back and we are here talking to Evie Hunnell. She is our composer for Hero Talk. So you know that like ditty we dance to before <laughs> every single episode is courtesy of Evie. Um, she is an amazing composer and pianist living in Nashville. And if you go on her website, you can listen to some amazing pieces that she's composed. And we are just so glad to have her here. Hi, Evie. Hi, thank you so much. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. So for anyone who doesn't know you, what, what would you like to say about yourself? What, like, what's your musical background and what have you done to like get into composing and being a pianist? Uh, well, I was one of those kids that like got put in piano lessons when I was four <laughs> and I just kept doing it and it just seemed to go well so I never stopped I was um, one of those kids too <laughs> I yeah <laughs> I grew up in a church setting so I was exposed to a lot of gospel music but our church also had a large community orchestra so very early on I heard a lot of music by popular composers you know John Adams John Williams you know maybe even some classical staples but they would put on performances in the park every month. So I got exposed to a lot of this big orchestral music and it just gripped me. Combined with a love of video games, you know, listening to a lot of music <laughs> by the, the blessed Koji Kondo, you know, the Mario theme mm -hmm. and Legend of Zelda. And I was always fascinated about the stories that music can tell, the kinds of emotions that different pieces can evoke and how something as simple as a melody can be transformed infinite ways to evoke different styles and different moods, but still have the same core musical elements. So the more I played and learned piano, the more I began to explore creating music, writing my own themes. I used to just 
play around and improvise and see if I could write something. And now I wish that I had kept all of those. <laughs> so uh, originally went into Belmont University with an intention to be a commercial pianist and then met some of the classical department and the composition department at the university and fell in love once again with writing music. And so I switched my major over and discovered a passion for composing for media, film and video games and podcasts. That is so cool because I actually went to Belmont for my undergrad. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I went, when I, I knew you were from Nashville, I think I might have saw you went to Belmont, but I didn't know if you graduated or not. But I was like, I went to Belmont too. <laughs> How exciting. Small world. I know it's a small little music school too compared to a lot of others oh goodness what's his name the orchestra director i can see his face uh dr greg dr greg that's yep. the one that uh I, I remember him he's a sweet he's a sweetie i do miss nashville do you like living in nashville no, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> why not it's fine people are wonderful and friendly and i've been exposed to absolutely amazing and talented musicians from all different genres unfortunately it is just an expensive place to live oh that's true that's very and, true. yeah it is growing you know, as, as a young musician it's it's tough to you know find my foothold here yeah where do you find yourself next if you were to move currently i'm looking at moving to vermont oh. or like a northern state due to the nature of my work I can do a lot of my things remotely. That is true. That must be nice. Mm -hmm. Going back to your time at Belmont and you really finding your passion in composition, what was the, if you can remember and if you still have it, your first composition that was premiered, It was and was it premiered at Belmont? And how did that fe feel? Good question. Thinking back through all the performances, I know, I'm yeah, sure. it's probably way too many. <laughs> well, one, one thing that I learned is hearing something played live for the first time is completely different than hearing it through like a playback engine. Mm -hmm. My first couple performances of original music, I'd say were big flops. Oh. And I'm really happy that they went that way because oh. I learned so much by failing <laughs> and by hearing my music and recognizing that doesn't work. And now I understand why that doesn't work. Oh, that's inspirational. Are you sure you weren't just too self-critical? Because everything you sent me sounds really cool. <laughs> yeah, she sent that's me like That's totally a, possible. Yeah. I mean, because you sent me like a like three recordings of music that you composed for us. And I was like, these are all yeah, really are good. good. I was yeah. like, they could all work. <laughs> it's hard to decide. <laughs> Thank um, you. I was... I, uh, we met because of Mac, Mac Nyes, who is right. in, who's yeah. at FSU and in like the hero class. And I originally asked her because she was like, oh, I compose stuff. And I was like, cool, you're already like in the class. And then she texts me. She's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then she was like, I have this amazing composer friend named Evie. And I was like, all right, I'll reach out. And then I like looked at your stuff. I was like, oh, she's so cool. You have a very official um, <laughs> website. Oh, I know. I'm so impressed. I was very Thank impressed. You. And the whole process of working with you has been like so easy, so professional as well, might I mm -hmm. add. And I really do feel like we snag like an up and coming composer. Oh, absolutely. Got, got to, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> so Goodness. just throwing Thank compliments you. your way to make, you know, brighten your day. <laughs> That's what we're here for. <laughs> but yeah, it was great working with her. And I love the ditty. We call it the mm -hmm. ditty. We don't know what else to call it. It's like 30 seconds of music. And every time we like play it, we're like swaying yeah. back and forth. Like, ooh, did it. <laughs> did we pick the one that you thought we would pick out of the three that you composed? You know, I really didn't know. I felt equally attached to all three of them in a different way. Mm -hmm. There was just a little piece of each one that I really loved. So ultimately, I was just happy with you picking any of them. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the process like composing for Hero? And like, also in, in that, what is your what is your general process of just composing any music? Like what's your first step when you're go trying to compose for a commission? The first step usually is the hardest, but the most fun for me is just trying to carve out what I think is a good theme. I, I spend hours uh, sitting at this desk where I just have my entire <laughs> musical life in, you know, a 10 foot area. Yeah, <laughs> sitting here and listening to music that inspires me and taking notes trying to figure out okay this kind of works this doesn't work for heroes specifically I went and listened to a bunch of different podcast themes uh like hypochondriactor oh I love them. and 
Yeah, that was at your recommendation. Nice. Well, that's just um, cute. Oh, that is true. I remember you asking me that question now. My bad. <laughs> and that classical podcast, uh, which is another fantastic, now discontinued, but wonderful mm-hmm. and hilarious classical music podcast with a great intro. I'm trying to find out like, yeah, this energizes me, but why? Mm-hmm. And then taking those music, taking those pieces and analyzing them, taking them apart. And then thinking, here's the elements that I want to include. Mm -hmm. And another part that was difficult for me was trying to incorporate feminine music. Like how, how does music sound feminine? Mm -hmm. Um, And I listened through most of the, the oeuvre of Fanny Mendelssohn and Clara Schumann trying to decipher the same thing. I'm like, this sounds feminine this doesn't but why Mm -hmm. do you think music sounds feminine because we know it's like composed by a female I think that has a big part in it if I had a couple classical pianists play side by side in the same era Mm -hmm. I would probably struggle to identify which one was which Mm -hmm. and if any were composed by female composers Mm -hmm. there is definitely a quality to music that makes it feminine but it's almost stereotypically feminine. Yeah, I've if I were to start dealt with thinking this kind of, of like distinctly feminine music. It's like, oh, it's all woodwinds and <laughs> yeah. it's very light and airy or, you know, mm-hmm. strings, nothing in the brass section, nothing percussive. But I also think that it's a sound which is still being defined. Mm-hmm. That like like you say, only 13% of composers are women Mm -hmm. and we're still kind of carving out that sound like what makes music distinctly sound like it was composed by a woman do you think we need to have a distinct sound because there's a part of me that feels like we never will because music is just music it's just like a common human experience like what's your opinion on that I don't think that we ever need to Mm -hmm. but personally I want to I I want to find out what makes music more feminine than masculine? All right. What elements, what intervals, and what combination of instruments mm-hmm. yeah. you know, make that come together? Well, I think you did a great job. I mean, I listened to it, and I was like, oh, this is exactly what I was like mm-hmm. thinking. Because I remember when I was telling <laughs> Evie about like what we were kind of aiming for for our theme, and I was like, I wanted it to almost feel like a bunch of women got together and played chamber music in like a salon, mm-hmm. you know? And it, I wanted it to be happy, you know, we, we don't want to depress anyone. <laughs> and it's like exactly what I was like thinking. And I love the end with like the little doop, <laughs> little pizzicato, staccato thing. Yeah. Um, it was just perfect. It was really good. Yeah. I think since you're aiming for like creating a feminine sound, I, I could easily describe this as feminine. Yeah. So I was reading your, your bio and um, you have a lot of compositions for more commercial type based things. So like a video game and... Um, a few other things like that. Is that something you like to compose more for, like commercial music or classical music? Or is it just all? When I first started composing, my goal was primarily to write music for film and video games. And that's still a large goal of mine. But I'm also very passionate and excited about making electronic music Mm. through mostly Ableton Live, experimenting with sounds, and uh, synthesis in order to create new sounds. Um, I think there's also fantastic unexplored territory there, which is definitely a part of like 21st century composition, which is combining Mm -hmm. both classical and electronic music. But as someone with a huge classical background, it is very much part of my history. And I have a very special place in my heart for classical music. (laughs) But I think as a, a modern composer, you have to have both Mm -hmm. yeah and I always think of like video games I don't know if it's true for like the the composer side of it but I always feel like it's a kind of a still male-dominated field do you feel like it's difficult as a woman to like break into that as a composer I think it's starting to get easier but it is definitely male-dominated like Mm -hmm. when I think of popular famous video game composers I think of Austin Wintory and Koji Kondo there's more than two. I know there's more than two, but I I do think a lot of the men that mm-hmm. have have really carved um, out what is what is standard mm-hmm. now for video game music. Uh, 
Grant Kirkhope is another one. And I, I think that video game music is definitely a male dominated field, but I think that as female composers begin to become more popular, mm-hmm. I suppose, as they are gathering more attention um, and we're, we're bringing more light to the fact that a lot of the composition and classical music world is male dominated, yeah. that we are slowly making more room for us. Yeah, I think as education go- moves forward and we start talking about more than the classical canon, I definitely see what you're talking about. Because mm-hmm. then people are like, hey, I'm going to listen to, like you said, like Claire Schumann, Fanny Mendelssohn. And outside of video game music, like what classical composers like inspire you? Is there any that you feel like has influenced like compositional style or anything like that? Well, I'm, I'm a big sucker for the big famous piano composers. <laughs> Love to see some Chopin preludes. No, not um, biased at all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely demolish the the list etudes. Mm-hmm. I I just finished doing a study of about half of the pieces in Pictures of an Exhibition What's by Mosnes Sorsky. Great piece. So slowly expanding into like famous Russian composers, getting into um, some Bartok and some Tchaikovsky as well. Nice. Uh, one of my all-time favorite composers, though, is he's kind of a big deal in the young pianist world right now, but he's still kind of getting that fame. And he only died, uh, I believe, two years ago. Oh, wow. uh, but he's a Russian composer named Nikolai Kapustin. Mm. And essentially, he has just adapted jazz piano into classical form. Oh, that's really impressive. So like jazzy piano sonatas and jazzy concertos. Uh, he has a collection called Opus, it's the Opus 48 Concert Etudes, and it is mwah, just fantastic. <laughs> it's some of the best writing and the most beautiful melodies I've ever heard. Incredibly interesting and unique piano texture, which I think is something that it, we're, we're in desperate need of, is mm-hmm. new sounds mm-hmm. on well-established instruments and he accomplishes this very well nice for anyone who's like a younger composer what would you say is like your advice to them like getting started and finding their voice as a composer don't be afraid to fail there there's a lot of pressure and expectation that you need to succeed right out of the gate it will not happen from my experience you need a couple years to write some flops and figure out what does and what doesn't work. Because all the time that you're doing that, you are subconsciously or consciously learning. These are the sounds that I like. These are the kinds of sounds that I write well. These are the instruments that I write well for. And once you have some of that experience, you can then look back on it and say, well, I wrote a lot for piano, but I didn't write a lot for low brass. So now it's time to start learning. How do I write for low brass? How do I write for strings? How do I write for voice? And all the while, you're building up your toolbox of skills, as I like to look at it, learning how to make a good melody, how to write a good progression, how to do texture, how to write uh, variations and really catchy melodies. Mm -hmm. It is just a long, long experience. And there are so many thousands of composers and pieces that come before us that, you know, where we're expected to learn and draw from so it's it's really easy to get overwhelmed Mm -hmm. and get very focused on like the minutia but it is an experience Mm -hmm. you have to be willing to fail you have to be willing to keep trying it is a lifelong journey Mm -hmm. yeah getting into the gear that you use a little bit so what kind of DAW what programs do you use and when you write music do you use Finale or Sibelius I use Finale to write my my scores and my charts, but I used to be a diehard MuseScore user. MuseScore. I I used to insist by MuseScore in every way that it was free, that it was fast, Mm -hmm. and then I learned Finale, (laughs) and now I feel spoiled. (laughs) Yeah. I think I've heard great things about Sibelius and Dorico as well, and I'm keeping a close eye on Dorico as a lot of other composers seem to think that it's going to be the finale killer. Oh, really? But I don't know. Okay. Finale seems to be the giant that. in the notation software world. Mm. Well, Dorico is like a DAW and 
a notation software built into one. Oh, okay. It's it is very interesting. It is not for me. <laughs> I'll hold off on it until it's not possible anymore. Okay. But I did the same thing with Finale, and now I love Finale. So oh, uh, <laughs> for my DAWs, I will tell. <laughs> <laughs> for my DAWs, I use Logic to write all of my classical and orchestral music with the Contact Factory Library Suite. Mm. Uh, and for all of my electronic music, I write in Ableton Live. Okay, I haven't used that one. Yeah, we use Logic on our end as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to bring us back a little full circle into like Hero being about uh, women. Do you feel like that you get more negativity as a female composer and also as a transgender woman? I think it really depends. There have been times where I've tried to write about my experience uh, and, and write music specifically for trans people, and it hasn't been well received. Hmm. And it is frustrating and it is hurtful, but I also think it's why it's so important for more minority composers to write about their own experiences because we don't have enough of it. There have certainly been times where I I feel misjudged because of my gender, but another part of being a composer is that you just don't know. Mm-hmm. You you face rejection and you face failure all the time and I never know what the reason behind it is. I just have to keep pushing forward. Mm -hmm. And I was really, I love that you're very open about it on like your bio and everything. And I think that speaks a lot to like up and coming composers who are in your same situation. You know, you're someone they can like look up to. And I think being a proud woman is so important for so many composers just because like even looking for, because I wanted specifically a woman composer to compose for a hero. And it was so hard. Like all the FSU people I was finding were like, men and I was like because that just goes to show how few female composers there are and I think the more that we push you know female composers and are you know open and proud about who we are I think the more we will start to see change and I really admire that about you Um, you. but that also makes me think uh, a little bit do you feel like this pressure of being a transgender composer like you're trying to represent anyone else who might be in your situation like i I'm, I'm just curious because sometimes as like I'm a bisexual woman, I'm like, I don't, there are moments where I was like, I hope I say the right thing if someone asked me a question about being bisexual or something like that. Do you feel like you have a sense of like pressure on you because of how you identify and there's so few female composers? I, I feel a responsibility to, to be myself and to identify openly as a trans woman because I want other trans people and other LGBT or allies to be able to recognize me Mm -hmm. but I have never felt responsible to represent my community I've always felt like I am just an individual and my story does not speak for the thousands of people who Mm -hmm. have had a much harder life than I have because I really have been quite fortunate in my life and in my, my journey as a musician and as a composer, as a trans woman. So I, I want to be able to rally other trans women and other people in the LGBT community with me that mm-hmm. we can work together, but I will never try and act like I am the representative for the trans community because there's no possible mm-hmm. way that I could be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just think sometimes it can people will automatically think, oh, if one you know gay person or transgender person thinks that way, it's like, I feel like, sometimes it automatically puts this pressure that everyone else thinks that way. It's like it takes away the humanity behind the person. And I do Mm -hmm. think music should just speak for itself as music, you know, and I'm glad that you're not letting yourself feel that way because I think you sound, your your music sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, I can't emphasize how excited I was with the, like all the music you threw our way. And I, we will be working with you again. I am quite confident. (laughs) Goodness. I can't wait. Yeah. Uh, no ditties. I know. <laughs> oh, so fun. <laughs> we have a trivia game, Diddy. That'd be cool. Oh, yeah. We, we talked about it. Right yeah. now, we just have sound effects that we are using. But that kind of is a good segue into our trivia game. Let's do think. it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to be asking Angela and you some trivia questions just to end on a fun note. So here's our little sound oh, effect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... 
we'll put Angela on the spot first. Oh, gosh. Okay. We like to dig into the fact that I'm the string player. And I <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> so, I feel like I'm slowly making my way <laughs> along oh the gosh. violin for parts of the violin. Um, I'm going to start studying before these <laughs> recording sessions. <laughs> so, I'm going to go off the bat and ask you uh, another part of the violin. Okay. So, question one. What is the tailpiece? The tailpiece is... Uh, let me think about this. Okay. Tailpiece, there's strings involved. Tailpiece. Yeah, Evie, if you know it, don't tell her. <laughs> you know it? No. Tailpiece. Tailpiece, I'm going to say. I don't even know which piece of the violin you would call the tailpiece. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't think it's the bow. I don't think, because like you have that frog and then an eye, I think. Yeah, you're right. It's okay. not, it's so not, it's not, not on, the on the bow. No, no. And it's not, I don't think the tailpiece, it's going to be on the bottom of the violin because tail and i think it holds the strings yeah Let's you are go. right <laughs> do you like our sound effects <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the clap we, li- so we like that like you. the golf the golfer clap yeah. all right so i'd be really surprised if you know this one but oh gosh okay i i did i did learn this oh okay so because i remember being super impressed as you know a female violinist all right who was the first female concert master of the civic orchestra in 1922 that's very specific yeah uh, okay um civic orchestra 1922 mm-hmm. oh gosh she's one of the first female concert masters in the u.s oh gosh i don't know yeah that's probably the hardest question i've ever asked you yeah <laughs> that frog one was hard too um <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna i don't i don't have a clue who this would be i'm gonna have to pass Oh man! <laughs> Sorry, we're huge dorks. I feel like you're looking at us like, wow, these people are weird. Uh, Not at all. Um, so her name was uh, Mildred Brown, and mm. she went to Chicago Musical College and the Juilliard. Oh, yeah, she was okay. concertmaster for I think two years. Dang. Okay. Yeah. Props to Mildred. Did she leave? Did she re- like retire, or what happened? Do you know? It, in her bio, did not say. Oh, dang but more research to do on I, I guess yeah <laughs> every time we do a trivia i'm like i probably should know the answer they asked because you're like why is it called a frog i'm like i don't know actually i did google it yeah and oh, most, of, most of the answers are like no one really knows oh i'm gonna do some deep <laughs> research i'm gonna call up all the violin makers i think it might have derived from like a german word mm. but, but most of it is just like speculation okay and i, I meant to tell you that uh, okay. But I loved how most of her like, no one really knows for sure. You just call it that. That's so funny. <laughs> um, all right, last question. All the string instruments tune their strings in fifths, except one. Which instrument tunes their strings in fourths? Okay, so I am 95% positive that a guitar is sh- Orchestral like string that. instruments. That could be orchestral. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, but... Of the basic ones. Sorry, guitarist. Yeah, you, <laughs> sorry. You, you have four choices. Apparently you have, not. You have violin, viola, cello, and bass. Okay, let me let me think about this. If I know the guitar is, how does that correlate to other string instruments? I don't think the guitar is going to help you. I don't think so either. <laughs> this is going to be a guess, but is it the? I don't think it's yours. I think I I think I remember that violins don't do that. So it's going to be, and so it's viola. So it has to be. It's not cello. String bass. Oh, that's cool. Winner, winner. All right, so Angela only got one point, so you only need two to win. I got two points, please. I got the oh yeah, you right. did. Yeah, please. the tailpiece. Never mind. Uh, my bad. I'm just trying to knock points off. Dang, <laughs> cheating. Oh, uh, so you got it. So we'll see if we can get a tie. All right, or maybe we'll get all three. Right. Oh, okay. So Evie's turn. <sighs> get ready. Okay. <laughs> so. The, you know, the, maybe like the cousin or the father of the piano, the harpsichord. How many keys does a harpsichord have? Ooh, I know my piano literature teacher would be frowning at me if I got this wrong. (laughs) Is it 55? No, you're really, really close. You want to take a second guess? Oh, 52. You were going in the wrong direction. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. The sad trombone. <laughs> yeah. It's 60. I had to Google this because I didn't know the oh, answer. Gosh. But I knew it was less than the grand piano, which mm. is 88. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I know it's smaller. And I was like, yeah. this is a great trivia question. <laughs> uh, Dr. Clefstad, if you ever listen to this, I'm so sorry. Have you ever played on a harpsichord? 
I've not actually. Belmont does have one, mm-hmm. but it's mm-hmm. kept under lock and key. Yes, Aww. I do remember that. Mm-hmm. Only a couple people played it when I was at Belmont. Um, they they value that instrument, which makes sense. But <laughs> I always wanted to play on it. I like how it's like plucking the strings and it's like all cute and ding 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 ding. We had one out in one of my institutions. I won't say the name, but it was out just sitting in the hall, and I was like, <laughs> I'm gonna play this. So I played a little bit of it. It was so fun. <laughs> <laughs> I actually turned pages for a harpsichord once at a at a concert mm. and it was like some Juilliard person and I kept screwing up the page strings. So I was like no. this high schooler and he kept having all these uh repeats or I have mm. to page turn backwards mm-hmm. and I was I was like oh crap I, was, I wasn't fast enough I felt so bad I was so embarrassed I've never paged in my uh. life and I never will it's so it looks terrifying <laughs> Shout out to all page turners. Yes. They're real MVPs. Like it is so stressful, but we appreciate you so much. Yeah. It's the when you have to go back is I was just too slow. Mm. And he did it a couple of times himself. And I was like, oh, the oh, embarrassment. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was really young and I was so nervous. All right. Uh, back on track. Question two. <laughs> when was the piano invented? <gasps> oh, no. That's another one. Like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm asking you all the piano questions since you're a pianist. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I really should know these. Mm. I feel like we all should. Let's be real. I mean, I played piano. (laughs) Piano was my first instrument. To be honest, I should know this as well. And I learned it when I was making up trivia questions. Dang. (laughs) Okay, I feel like we... I remember the, the inventions that had to come together for the modern piano to be created. So it was around i think it's around the 1800s i'm oh but then the look that i got oh no angela's like i'm gonna help you i gotta help her yeah (laughs) gosh i'm gonna back up say what i meant to say was 18th century so oh yeah 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 back on track there we go um (laughs) i'm gonna say 1759 you were so like the numbers you're off by one. Oh my gosh 1709 yeah <laughs> five. Oh yeah. my gosh yeah 1709 50 years too late by harpsichord maker bartolomeo di francesco cristofori in italy i have no idea if i said okay. that italian name right <laughs> it's, it's a lot of syllables but um interesting fact a harpsichord maker is like hey let's use a hammer <laughs> Instead of plucking. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> now, last question. So I had to throw a string player question in there, but I feel like you totally might know. Fair. All right. What famous violin soloist was rumored to have sold his soul to the devil? Dun, dun, dun. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> it's not Johnny Cash. We finally had a reason to use that button. Yeah. Ooh. Was it Paganini? Yeah. Ooh. Yay. Yeah, yeah, you sense. got one. He probably did. Probably. Yeah. I I wrote yeah. uh, a research paper on him, and there's like a lot of reasons why some people think he might have sold his soul to the devil. Besides, how he was like ridiculously good for that time period. Mm-hmm. But like people thought he like looked like a skeleton because he's really he tall yeah. and he was had really long sp- <laughs> like spindly Lanky. fingers. Um, they they thought, and he was like kind of pale according to some documents. Because um, he always practiced. <laughs> Probably always never went outside. Room. Never saw the <laughs> always in the practice room. Yeah. yeah, I remember. I think I had a teacher tell me like as like a folklore legend. They're like, there's rumors that he like died on a boat playing violin. Like never heard before. Before the devil met him and took him. To- oh god! <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh! It's probably a made up story, but all that surrounds the notorious Michael Paganini, still mm. haunting all violinists today. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, we are playing those Paganini Caprices. Never, we'll never die. All right. Well, that concludes all we have for you, Evie. Thank you so much yeah, for talking you. to us today. Wow. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so everyone, go and look at Evie's bio, which is on our website at www.her-omusic.com. Um, we would also love for you to comment on this podcast and let us know what you think and spread the love for Evie. And... Uh, Let us know what you think of her little ditty. We'd love to pass on more compliments her way. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And please give us five stars, and we will uh, see you later. Mm -hmm.